Mobile development done at scale is really, really challenging. And in this video, I'm going to give you 39 different reasons why this is the case. Hey, this is Gary Gay with The Pragmatic Engineer. And you might notice that my bookshelf is a little bit different behind me. Let me show you why. I just finished and released my book, Building Mobile Apps at Scale, 39 Engineering Challenges. This book is free to download as a PDF until the 31st of May. It's a book with more than 200 pages that covers the 39 most common mobile engineering challenges that I've observed. It's split in five parts. Part one is about why mobile is different. Part two covers challenges when the app complexity grows. Part three is about challenges when you have large engineering teams, 20, 50, 100 mobile engineers working on the same code base. Part four is about the cross-platform approaches from Kotlin multi-platform to Flutter, React Native, and other approaches. And part five is about approaches when you're building world-class applications experimentation, performance, analytics, on-call, code quality checks, and so on. So if you'll be interested beyond what we're going to talk about the video, go and grab it. I've been building native mobile apps for more than 10 years. And in the last five years, I built these apps at Skyscanner and at Uber. I've sat on countless meetings with non-mobile managers and engineers where I heard the same things again and again. Oh, but mobile is just a front end. It's just a client side. It's not really where the complexity is. The back end, yeah, that's difficult. But yeah, the mobile should be trivial. I built large distributed systems and large mobile apps and you know which one is more challenging to build? They're both equally challenging when done at scale. And at scale, I mean building and supporting apps that are used by millions of people in dozens of different countries or are built by large engineering teams. There's a few different broader reasons why mobile is challenging. First, mobile development is fundamentally different than web or backend development. It actually has the most parallels with thick client development. So with desktop apps, Windows or Mac apps, except it has some quirks that those apps don't even have. Second, large apps have complexities of their own. From the architecture to how you test automatically or manually, these become interesting problems to solve. Third, when you have large mobile engineering teams, development becomes difficult. This is true for most projects, but mobile has this quirk with the long build times, the non-maturity of tooling, and few architectures supporting very large teams. Fourth, cross-platform approaches. Build once, run everywhere on iOS, Android, possibly even the web, are becoming more and more popular. There's a lot of different approaches to choose from, from Kotlin multi-platform to Flutter, React Native, Core of Ionic, Xamarin, Go Mobile, Share C++ libraries. There's a lot of stuff that you can do there. And each have their trade-offs. Finally, building world-class applications that are reliable, you can iterate on them fast, performant, secure, compliant, and you're building it in ways where you don't need to keep backend endpoints alive forever. Now, I've been explaining the same thing again and again on these meetings to people on why mistakes are harder to revert on mobile, why experimentation needs to be thought, why feature flags can become a major problem that you need to clean up afterwards, and so on. And in the end, this is what led me to write this book because I didn't want to repeat myself again and again. I'm gonna very briefly walk through all of these 39 areas and you can grab this book and read more in each of the topics that you're more interested about. One important thing, I spent months full-time writing this book and the reason I was able to do this and give away the PDF version for free is thanks to mobile tooling vendors who I mentioned in the book to start with, but then I reached out to them and said, hey, could you sponsor the book so I can give away the book for free for a month and a half? These vendors are companies whose products I recommend and they're Bitrise. They're one of the first mobile first CI and CD solutions. Bugsnack for crash reporting and best in class app stability. Sonar source for static and Analysis and code security. Their Sonar Cloud product is free for open source repositories. Revenue Cat to make in app purchases so much easier. Touch Lab if you need Kotlin multi platform experts. And perf.dev for a mobile performance platform. So let's jump into why mobile is different. And I covered this in part one of the book, state management. Mobile has a lot more state changes than some of the other applications that you're used to developing, backend, web, even thick clients. And the number one headache, especially with large applications, is always because of unexpected, non-deterministic events and the corresponding state changes. The other biggest reason why mobile development is difficult, frustrating, and mistakes are expensive is when you ship a binary, it's gone. And Chuck Rossi from Facebook Engineering phrased it like this. It was the most terrifying thing to take 10,000 diffs, package it into effectively a bullet, fire that bullet at the horizon, and once it leaves the barrel, it's gone. I cannot get it back, and it flies flat and true with no friction till the heat of the death of the universe. I can't fix it. And I love this analogy because this sums up one of the biggest challenges with mobile engineering. And there's a long tail of app versions that stem from this. Deep links. Alberto de Bortoli, principal iOS engineer at Justy, put it very plainly. Deep linking is one of the most underestimated problems in mobile. 
And deep links are a unique problem that you don't need to deal with on the web because it's just part of how the web is structured or on the back end. The larger the app, the more trouble deep links can give you. Push and background notifications, some challenges to implement them and making sure that they work reliably, especially across both platforms. App crashes, mobile app crashes are a terrible experience and you want zero crash rate, which honestly is, is very difficult to get to and maybe not even practical. You'll want to start with crash reporting solutions such as Bugsnack, Crashlytics or other, other vendors offline. These devices go offline a lot and you need to prepare for it. You need to make sure that your app handles offline cases, including edge cases where the device thinks it's online, but the latency of the network is so high that it might as well be offline. Accessibility. This is something that the web also needs to worry about. You'll need to make sure that your app supports the accessibility needs for various users. Continuous integration and continuous deployment. This is a topic that is not the most straightforward thing, even on the back end or on the web, but oh boy, on mobile, you get a whole set of different problems. Most of them are related to the speed of builds on mobile, especially when it comes to testing, automated unit testing, not so much, but UI testing, snapshot tests, and so on. The larger the company, the more effort they're going to spend on build systems if you build it yourself, or you can get a vendor solution such as Bitrise and some other vendors who take the heavy load off of you. Using third-party libraries is a risk on mobile, especially because they can crash your application. Google Maps and the Facebook SDKs have crashed thousands of applications for tens of millions of users when they had a bug committed into them. Device and operating system fragmentation is a huge problem on Android. It's very common to see mobile teams having dozens of devices or using device test labs. This is less pronounced on iOS, but there is a growing number of OS versions and devices that you'll need to test on in-app purchases, a huge revenue source for many of the mobile apps. But considering that Apple and Google take a 15 to 30% fee, they're ridiculously difficult to implement and even more difficult to modify, to keep track of reporting, and to do cross iOS and Android in-app purchase implementations. The in-app purchase section is the longest in the book. And if you need to use in-app purchasing, you probably want to get a third party tool that helps you with some of the heavy lifting. This can be revenue cap or some other vendor which just saves you a lot of time and they bridge a lot of the platform differences between iOS and Android. These were 12 areas that are very unique to mobile. Except for accessibility, the web teams or the backend teams are not really gonna come across any of these challenges. And you have to deal with these even if you're doing a small app. Now, as the app grows, you start to add more and more features, more screens, more state, more entry points, and the app complexity just explodes. Challenges with large apps include figuring out your navigation architecture, which ironic enough, there are no opinionated solutions across iOS or Android. Android, you'll have to come up with your own or copy someone else's approach. The bigger the app, the more state will become a problem and handling state changes. To fight this, you'll want to minimize state in the app. Localization will become a problem once your app hits multiple locales. And for example, in the case of Uber, we had the app localized for more than 40 different languages. Just having the tooling to make sure that you're using the same localization across iOS, Android, possibly the web and the back end. You either need to build tooling for this or you need to find a vendor who does this. Your app's architecture will become more important to make it more maintainable. You'll want to ensure your components are independent, they're testable. You'll likely want to introduce dependency injection if you've not done already. And of course, for complex apps, you will want to have automated testing, unit, integration, snapshot, and UI tests. There's no golden solution of which ones you should prefer. Should it be unit tests, UI tests, snapshot tests? And every large app approaches it slightly differently. Just look at the numbers here. Spotify is biased towards unit tests. They also have some snapshot and, and fewer UI tests. And by the way, this was a similar approach to what we did at Uber. We had a huge amount of unit tests, a few integration tests, and a lot of snapshot tests. You can see how different apps are going in different direction. Airbnb has a lot of unit tests, tons of screenshot tests, but they still don't have any UI tests. They're actually working on adding those. The book lists a lot more examples on testing approaches than other large companies. And manual testing. With a complex app, manual testing is always a pain. It takes time, it's error prone, and you need to do it again and again either with an in-house team or with a third-party vendor. When your engineering team grows large, you're gonna see a lot more challenges related to planning, architecting, build time issues, sharing architecture across several apps, and getting the right mobile platform libraries in place. Part three of the book addresses exactly these topics. Now, cross-platform is a whole different can of worms. It is very tempting to run with the idea of, hey, let's write the code once, and it'll just run everywhere, on iOS, on Android, and maybe on different platforms as well. Back when mobile apps started, there were not too many cross-platform approaches 
approaches, but now there's an explosion of tools that you can choose from. And I categorize them into two buckets. Approaches where you can share the business logic between features, but you still use native code. One of the most promising approaches is using Kotlin as a shared code, as Kotlin multi-platform and Kotlin multi-platform mobile. One of the sponsors of the book, Touch Labs, has specialized in this approach. And a lot of other large tech companies like Netflix, VMware, Square, they are all starting to adopt this approach. Now there's other approaches that you can choose to share this business logic across iOS and Android. A less conventional approach is to use Uber's ribs library, where you don't share any of the code, but you share the architecture. And it makes it really easy to collaborate between the two code bases and review each other's code. C++ as a shared language used to be popular. It is still for some projects, but for example, Dropbox is moving away from sharing C++ code because of all the downsides they've seen. Sharing your business logic in Go using Go Mobile or with Java using J2 Objective-C or even in JavaScript can be an approach. But to be honest, I think they all come with downsides and none of them feel truly mobile first. My bet is that the future of sharing cross-platform native code will go with Kotlin multi-platform. Now, if you wanna build your whole app in a way that you can share it between platforms, Flutter and React Native are by far the most popular approaches, and Flutter is picking up some real steam. Google is going all in on Flutter. They're building their Google Pay app, Stadia, Google Ads, and Google Nest Hub fully in Flutter. And a lot of our big companies like eBay Motors, Nubank, BMW, and some others are going all in on Flutter. They're changing their whole code base to be Flutter. The downside of Flutter is you need to use a different language, Dart, in order to write your applications, but it's a very well thought out framework and quite performant as well. React Native has been around for a long time. Facebook created this technology. They use it to some extent, but not nearly as much as Google is going all in with Flutter. And the reception has been mixed. Airbnb gave it an honest shot, used it for three years, and then they just moved off of it. They published a retrospective of what went wrong, and a lot of it had to do with native engineers not really wanting to use React Native. On the other hand, Shopify is going all in on React Native, which should not be too surprising because they're a lot more of a web-based product. And for example, Wix is also building their app in React Native. Xamarin is a good option for Microsoft and C Sharp teams, and a lot of smaller and larger companies are using it with good success. And then we have everyone else, Cordova, NativeScript, Ionic, and some up and coming smaller frameworks. Take your choice. One thing that people tend to underestimate when choosing a cross-platform approach is the actual cost and how much native expertise they might still need to build a quality application. The book goes into more details in all these approaches and also in web, PWA, and backend driven apps as well. The final part of the book is I think what is the bread and butter of large mobile apps. I go through the techniques that large mobile teams use on a day-to-day -day basis to ship reliable apps as quickly as they can with as few errors as possible. And this becomes really challenging to do when you do have millions of users and dozens or even hundreds of features. Experimentation is a baseline approach and shipping any logic changes behind the feature flags is as well. You later need to clean up those feature flags, otherwise you'll get yourself in a feature flag hell situation. And you also want to monitor your application both at the business level, at the crashes level, and just caching anything that might not be going right. Mobile Uncle is something that larger mobile teams do put in place. We had it at my team at Uber. It is a tricky one on how to set it up. Do you merge it with backend? Do you only have mobile engineers be on call? And how do you handle that overlap that will always happen with the backend? If a backend endpoint is down, your mobile alerts will fire and your backend alerts will fire as well. Do you want to have two different people woken up or do you only have one person? Stepping up your game and having better quality checks in build time becomes really important when you have large teams and large apps. So having linting in place, static analysis, advanced lint rules, those are all things that companies that care about quality do. This is where tools like Sonar Cloud, Sonar Cube, and a lot of our static analysis and linting tools can help, and you probably want to set those up early on. Mobile performance becomes table stakes for large apps that have millions of users, and a lot of them are using them on low-end Android or even iOS phones. You need to measure performance, you need to make sure you don't have really bad degradations, and you need to be able to catch those issues when they happen, or at least not too long after. And performance can be about app startup time, networking performance, battery consumption rate, parallel networking calls, application not responding, frozen frames, slow rendering frames, animations, UI rendering performance. I cover a lot of this in the book. The better known your app, the more important compliance and privacy and security become. To be clear, they should be important for every single app, but when you're in the spotlight, it's way more important. PII, GDPR, PCI DSS, FERPA, FCRA. The book covers some of the more popular ones, but with compliance, privacy, and security, you'll need to rely on external experts as well, or some in-house experts to make sure you're not accidentally doing any breaches that you're not supposed to. Putting a good force upgrading system in place, monitoring the app size, and client-side data migrations on write are also some challenges, and I think that's it. I basically talked you through this book,
but I've only scratched the surface. All of these areas can be pretty interesting slash challenging. It takes time to get them right. And so if someone asks, why is building mobile apps difficult, especially when they're large mobile apps, this is why. If you're a mobile engineer and you think I missed out some challenges that you're aware, but I'm not, please leave a comment or message me. I'd like to make sure I capture all the major challenges. Now, the book is free until the 31st of May for a very good reason. I'd like to raise awareness of mobile apps not being that simple to as many people as possible. So if you're a mobile engineer, feel free to grab your free copy of the book. And also, please send it to people who are not mobile engineers on your team, to managers, to backend, to web engineers, to product managers. An Android engineer from Square wrote a review on the book, and he said, I wish this book was released five years ago. Then I would just hand the book over to non-mobile managers asking why it takes so long to build a feature and get back to app development. And I've heard a lot of people actually send the link to this book to the stakeholders and people they work with who tend to assume that mobile should be pretty simple. It really shouldn't take that long. Why is the web team already done? I hope you'll find this book useful. Even though it took a lot of time, I had fun writing it and I'd love to hear any feedback that you have. For the future videos, my bookshelf will go back to normal. But first, I have to ship these more than 30 books to the mobile engineers and managers who help write and review this book. You'll find a list of all of their names in the credits on the website or on the book. Please hit like and subscribe if you'd like to hear more about software engineering and engineering management on this channel. Thanks, and now I need to ship these books.